Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, even good night, uh, dear viewer, wherever you happen to be. For a change of pace, I thought we might have a look at uh, two very interesting board game designs that um, even to this day, uh, some 55 odd years, uh, if not longer, since they were first released, are still quite popular, still played at the, uh, I think in America, the World Board Game what is it, Championships, WBC. Um, all springing from one original design by a chap called John Edwards here in Australia. Uh, this particular design, now this is the Avalon Hill version. Avalon Hill purchased that particular design from uh, John Edwards, his company Jedco, uh, released it as War at Sea. Um, now from this particular uh, design, also John Edwards, those of you of the board game community would be familiar with another very popular design of his, the Russian campaign. But from that particular design, there has been an absolute plethora of new games, variants, uh, all sorts of um, offshoots, perhaps, for a, a, a better word. So Avalon Hill first released this as an introductory game, I believe, now don't quote me, 1976? Might have been 1975. I think the original Jedco version was circa about 1975. Um, could have been earlier, but um, I think Avalon Hill's version about 75. A couple of years after that, and we, we will have a look at the various components of the game and so forth. A couple of years after that, um, Richard Hamblin, working at Avalon Hill, um, developed uh, the War at Sea into a Pacific version for his own uh, enjoyment. Um, he quotes in the General magazine, which was their uh, pub, um, publication by Avalon Hill. Originally, it was a 33 area <laughs> game um, with every division, every combat air group, etc., etc. Uh, you could play it, to quote Richard Hamblin, for a long time. Uh, eventually, 1977, I believe, was the year out came uh, Victory in the Pacific, uh, which generally is agreed by most gamers to be a much better game uh, than its uh, original protege. Uh, after War at Sea 2, there were a lot of there have been a lot of suggested variants for both games in the in the general uh, over the years before that publication ceased. Uh, Avalon Hill eventually decided that uh, so many of these were such good ideas, they released War at Sea 2, uh, which we'll open up and have a look at uh, shortly. Uh, since then, um, we had... Um, Jedco went back, again, taking advantage of the various changes recommended. I think it was about 1992, again, don't quote me, and released this little special, Victory at Sea. Now, basically, it's, it's War at Sea upgraded, a little bit like War at Sea 2. Um, that came out in 1992. We'll have a look at the box of that uh, in a minute. Um, following on from that, uh, LG2 Design Group, a uh, company that sadly I don't think are with us anymore, they released their version of uh, War at Sea. I think they called it Victory at Sea. Uh, reminded me a lot of War at Sea 2 the module released by Avalon Hill. Uh, that introduced uh, some of the mechanics, game mechanics of Victory in the Pacific to the War at Sea system. Uh, sadly, 
for whatever reason, that uh, company hasn't survived. They were going to do a Pacific version, but um, as I say, never never survived. Um, World War One offshoots. Uh, if you go over and have a look at uh, the Diomede F-16, Ian's channel, uh, he purchased a game called Nine Navies War. Um, I think it still might be available on eBay. Um, a First World War version of the War at Sea. More recently, Gilbert Collins. Uh, if you go and have a look at his channel, I believe, if not already published, on Kickstarter. He's got a World War variant, uh, Kaiser's Fleet. Uh, and then, as far as World War II's combined, um, now, on a chap by the name of Brian Herr, uh, forgive me, Brian, if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, H-E-R-R, uh, has recently released on Canvas Temple Publishing, uh, combining the Pacific and uh, Atlantic theatres, uh, a game called Admiral's War. Now, this is the rule book, um, downloadable, um, so no infringement of copyright, etc., etc., so if you think you might be interested, I would encourage you to download and, and have a read. Some very good ideas. Takes a bit after the LG2 in that it, it uses some of the movement mechanics for Victory in the Pacific, uh, translate them into the uh, Atlantic theatre. Adds a lot of sea areas, as many of the variants uh, do. Uh, and hopefully we'll end this video by looking at some of my favourite variants to the games. Um, this headline, Improving Yahtzee at Sea. The game's detractors, their big bugbear is the uh, combat system. It, it's just, it really is from a simulation point, um, rudimentary in the extreme. It's, it's a buckets of dice thing. Um, Basically, it's area movement. You move into an area, um, both sides, you fight it out, and whoever's left standing at the end of it gets points of control for uh, controlling that particular area. Um, I would love to get a copy of this game. I, I Canvas Temple Publishing, I think last time I looked, they've only got six copies left. Um, he does have a, a precursor of this uh, on Board Game Geek. If you'd like to go there, you can actually download everything, including the counters. Now, I believe there is a difference between this and uh, Brian's um, first design that's available for free on, on Board Game Geek. But um, if you don't mind um, cutting out, pasting, all that sort of stuff, um, creating your own game, um, you can do so um, off Board Game Geek there for free. Uh, personally, I'd like to pick this up, but unfortunately, the cost hundred and hundred and five hundred and ten US. It it is a big box, a weighty tome. Um, don't quote me, seven pounds. Uh, so you you certainly get a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, as I say, hundred and five hundred and ten dollars. Um, that's probably about a squazillion dollars Australian, and then on top of that. The cost of postage from America to Australia, that's even if they're doing it, they banned us for a while. <laughs> we must have smelt too bad during COVID. Um, I'd probably have to get some sort of special courier. So you're probably looking at at least another $100 US um, in postage. So I just about have to mortgage the house again to get it delivered. But I, I would dearly love a copy of this myself. But anyway, the point is there have been an absolute, as I say, plethora of variants for this game. Um, a simple and easy way, rather than buy, if you're interested in these games or if you have them, um, a simpler and easier way of uh, getting your hand on all the different variants and so forth, uh, rather than having a stack of old general magazines like I've got, Purchase this off eBay, Victory in the Pacific, War at Sea, PDF reference disc. 
um, includes a lot of articles in various magazines, uh, not just those of the general. Uh, includes the game maps, all the components. Uh, again, if you don't mind a bit of cutting, pasting, printing, um, you can create your own games from something as simple as this. You can see there is at uh, tonysbooks.com off eBay. Um, I've, I've only purchased this, I don't know, two years ago, three years ago. So if, um, if Tony's Books is... Um, I assume they're probably still going. If not, you could probably find something uh, similar. Uh, now, doubtless I've, I've miss, missed off, uh, not missed, well, yes, I have, I've missed up. I've doubtless I've missed um, somebody's favourite variant or version of the game out there. As I say, there's, there's literally, literally dozens. Uh, but there, hopefully, I've just covered some of the main ones. Um, as far as the components go, I have purchased at great expense several years ago from Camelot Games some um, replacement counters for the games because obviously they're, as I say, 50 plus years old. Uh, that's Now that's just a little damage marker. Now you can see it's actually a sort of a, a hard plastic. Um, and I got a set of replacement counters from Camelot Games. Uh, now these these are split into three boxes. I think that's the Pacific at the bottom, um, that's the variants in the middle, and the War at Sea one at the top, which we'll have a look at some of the counters. I got Camelot Games to print uh, on the reverse of the uh, counters. Uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look at say Victorious. Uh, we'll pop it down here and then we'll zoom in a bit. Just bear with me. Uh, now, the variant counters from um, Camelot Games include War at Sea 2, War at Sea, and Victory in the Pacific. What I got them to do in Victory in the Pacific, you, you need to have counters that you can flip. Uh, they have what's called patrolling and raiding ships, uh, which don't exist uh, in the original War at Sea system. Um, but with the combined game, uh, you can take that movement system from Victory in the Pacific. Uh, but of course, you need to have um, values on the back. So, ta-da! I got um, Camelot Games to um, put values on the reverse. Um, and this is this is how, Vic oh, that'll do, it gives you the idea. This is how Victory in the Pacific does it. This sort of white side uh, is what they call a raiding ship. They move second. Um, they can't control a sea area. Uh, remembering, as I said, the basic mechanic is you've got a sea area, both sides move into it, punch up, Whoever's left standing gets control of the sea area and um, wins points. Um, in Victory in the Pacific, it actually has to be a patrolling ship. In other words, a ship with this side up for you to control the sea area. Uh, raiding ships can move a little bit further, uh, but they even if they win the sea area, but you've only got raiding ships there, you don't get the points of control for, for, for that area. Um, but anyway, so I got them to do this for me. Um, very nice counters, very thick. As I say, I think it's a sort of a plasticky, forgive me, Camelot Games if I've got that wrong, but far more durable than the old cardboard counters that we'll uh, have a look at in a minute. And of course, being a gamer, well, one of the things various variants have done over the years is give different values for the ships, which we'll have a look at in a sec but of course being being a gamer I couldn't help resist a bit of uh, patriotic fervor shall we say and uh, designed and printed my own counters um, if you want to know how to do that uh, Stuka Joe channel has uh, a couple of interesting videos on how to do that um, control markers to say who shows 
which controls which area. A bit cheeky, an Australian World War II ensign, or what I think is an Australian World War II ensign. And on the other side, a Japanese control. The French were in the Pacific and the Atlantic, if you want to include the French fleet. Ta da! Oh, oh, oh. Um, German on the other side. I think I've even got a French one with a Japanese flag, I think. Well, maybe not. Um, and of course, the Italians, I felt, deserved their own control flags. Why not? Uh, well, we've got British on one side. Yeah. Uh, and I went ahead and created my own. Some of my own counters. Um, one of the things that the game, or the games, hasn't got quite right, um, the British uh, had a lot of light, of what the game calls light cruisers, six inch cruisers. Um, and I feel that the British should be given some sort of credit for, for that. Um, the games tend to only include the 8-inch cruisers, uh, but things like the Edinburgh and Belfast, except for the fact they had... Just to show you. They're not the greatest, but, you know, they work. There's the rating side on the back. Um, these were 10,000 tonne ships, same as the county class, and they were better armoured. Um, but they don't get a Monty in the game because they're six-inch cruisers. Now, the British decided, as I understand it, prior to World War II, um, that in the northern climate, um, where often it was uh, wet, cold and poor visibility, that the increased rate of fire of the six-inch gun cruiser uh, offset the advantage of range and, if you, I, I guess, firepower, the hit power of the heavier eight-inch gun. Um, and so the British had masses of these. Um, think of the Battle of the River Plate. Um, speaking of the devil, uh, Ajax and Achilles. Um along with the Exeter taking on the Graf Spey. Now, in the basic War at Sea game, these two ships don't even appear. Um, hmm, yeah, no, nah, I think they should be in the game. Not too many, um, but I think there should be some representation of light cruisers. Now, we can nitpick about you know, whether they should be 117 or 107, the first number is the dice number of dice they throw in combat. The second number is its damage. That's how much uh, damage it can tolerate. So if it gets to two damage, uh -uh, it sinks. And the, the last number, the seven, is its speed. Now that's for surface ships. And of course, you know, Pax Australis, <laughs> Perth, Sydney and Hobart. Um, Sydney, um, of course, was sunk... Uh, by a German auxiliary uh, cruiser when it was ambushed. Uh, put my tongue back in. When it was ambushed and got too close. Um, rather sad ending for the Sydney. No one survived. Some The German auxiliary cruiser was sunk, but uh, sadly no one from them uh, survived. Um, and just while I was explaining those factors, one thing I should do... For the carriers, uh, and this system is the same across both games, again, you have gunnery factor at the front, um, armour factor, they call it in the middle, how many hits it can take, um, greater than that, and it sinks, and then it's speed. With the carriers, you've got a little number out the side here, that three. That means um, if you are f fighting with your aircraft, um, generally you have... Uh, day action or night action. Um, I'd prefer the term air or surface. Um, but if you're fighting a day action, the carriers get to fire, fight, and they use their uh, aircraft carrier, uh, sorry, aircraft 
value. Um, whereas if, of course, during the day you use the surface combat value. Um, if either of those has a little uh, s a white circle around them, that means they get a bonus when they're when they're fighting. So you know, plus one on the dice sort of type situation. Um, so yeah, they're the variant counters that I made up myself. Um, how many of them I include, don't include? Wow, well, you know. Um, if I included the Sydney, I had to include the Colleoni, <laughs> which got sunk by the Sydney. Um, and, of course, if you're going to add the British light cruisers for game balance, you need to add just a few of the Axis uh, forces. Um, now, I, I have fiddled with these values. If you look at the start of the video, you'll see the... Um, you see the... Uh, Video counters where they're at it. Uh, video counters, variant counters that I've made it uh, values. So I've got the Collingsburg, Colliani, and Bandonier just to balance out. Uh, so yeah, so they were from Camelot, Camelot Games in Canada, I think. Sorry if I've got that wrong. Uh, and those before COVID, um, but they, excellent service. Um, would recommend them highly. Anyway, let's have a, a, a just a quick look at the games and a, perhaps a bit of a chat about why I think they're still comparatively popular, even after all these years. Let's have a look. Now, here you have the Avalon Hill or at Seaboard. Now, as you can see, the board is split into these various sea areas uh, and as I say usually the or in the original rules the British would move first um, there was just the British the Germans and the Italians the British would move first move into all the sea areas then the Germans and Italians would move out uh, there would be submarine warfare air warfare, and then basically a surface slug out until only one side was left in a sea area. Uh, sorry about the shine from the uh, light. I don't know if we can zoom in or enough. Let's try lifting it up. I don't know if you can see that there, but say, for example, the North Sea, um, if the Axis control that, they get three points. If the Allies control that, they get one point. Oh, and of course, um, later on in the game, the uh, Americans uh, rock up. Um, now, from a, sort of a, a historical point of view, the the big... Sorry, I'll try and put this down so you're not getting quite so seasick as you're wobbling around. The main problems with the game was the, the as I say, it wasn't meant to be a died in the wool simulation. It was an introductory war game. Um, a lot of the British fleet was missing, as was some of the Italian fleet. Um, but in the rules, the, there were these four Italian cruisers and they could sail past Gibraltar to and from the South Atlantic Ocean whenever they liked. Likewise, the Germans could um, move through the English Channel uh, back and forth um, as and when they pleased, um, which, of course, uh, to quote, I think, grew nettles under the tongue of one particular <laughs> reviewer. Um, but, as I say, a good, fun, simple game. Uh, nice, simple rules. Uh, these now here's some of the advanced. This is the War at Sea two counters, um, as well as the original uh, War at Sea counters. Um, some of the now War at Sea two, uh, along with several artic articles, introduced several things like a lot of the missing British ships. Ships, something wrong with my tongue today. Uh, and see if we'll focus. There we go. Oh. Bloody hell. Somebody shoot me. 
that's not going to work. I'm going to swear in a minute. Um, stay. Now, hopefully you can see they introduce things like the French fleet. Um, the Richelieu there, 466. All sorts of things like that. Uh, anyway, cut a long story short, the, uh, as I say, War at Sea 2 added more um, air units, made it a lot more like Victory in the Pacific, added added a lot of the missing ships, um, Italian frogmen, um, uh, more convoys, torch convoy. Um, let's go back a bit here. So by Paul Custer and Alan R. Moon, um, again, incorporated a lot of the suggestions from the, the general uh, magazine. Uh, more sea areas. Um, as I say, increase the size of the British fleet. Um, more convoys, but actually introduced, um, again, something that was missing in the original game, uh, was removing some British ships, because, of course, the British had to send uh, forces over to... Um, uh, the Pacific, uh, which in the original War at Sea game they didn't have, they don't have to do, and we've already seen a picture of this at the start of the video. Uh, a much much bigger map, more sea areas added the Caribbean and the Cape of Good Hope, um, the Black Sea. Uh, Mediterranean, still just one sea area. Um, changes I'd like to make when they, for both games, I don't think there's enough sea areas in either. Now, Brian's design, Admiral's War, adds a lot, splits the North Atlantic into a lot more areas, and I think that's correct. Uh, but I also think Victory in the Pacific needs more sea areas. Um, the actual design of the, now this is a paper map, but the actual design of the um, counters and the board map, very 1970s um, colours, particularly the Victory in the Pacific board, um, perhaps by today's standard, a little garish. Uh, but again, when you go searching on good old Dr Google, you will find people who've done much improved more realistic uh, maps. Okay, we'll pause the video there as I pack that up and then we'll have a look at Victory. Right, so Pacific. Victory in the Pacific. Um, fabulous game, fabulous game. I actually purchased this first before I bought The War at Sea. I only found out about The War at Sea by, by buying this and realising that there was a uh, precursor that covered the Atlantic Theatre. Uh, Richard Hamblin's Opus in my book. Uh, we'll have a look at the map in a minute. Um, now, again, more variants than you can poke a stick at. Um, adding more ships, um, different combat rules, etc., etc. Um, there are uh, two editions of the Victory in the Pacific rules. Uh, this was actually the second edition I purchased. Um, lots of lovely counters. Uh, as you can imagine at the start, the Japanese run amok. It's, just, it's showing a bit of age there, isn't it? Um, this is the original Allied Order of Appearance starting at turn two. Um, the turn one Order of Appearance for the Allies is contained on the back of the uh, rule book. Rule book. Again, uh, lots of lovely counters. Exactly the same across both games. Uh, let's get one out. Same sort of thing uh, what have we got here. See if I can not drop it this time. Megami. So you get the ship silhouette. Now the one with a circle around it indicating that it gets a bonus uh, in combat. Uh, the middle one there, it's it's a heavy cruiser, so it takes one point of damage and then uh, eight for its speed. Um, 
I don't use the canners anymore. I bought, I use the um, Camelot uh, designs, uh, replacement canners. Uh, submarines, variants introducing midget subs at um, the midget subs at uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, variant values for different uh, of the ships uh, where they disagree on speed. Uh, what have we got under here? Oh, <laughs> some of the multitude of multitude of variants. Uh, Richard Hamblin did release in the general a article entitled Victory at Sea where you combine both games. Uh, and here's uh, just one of the many articles, Realistic Victory at Sea. Not a bad little article, that one. Um, this again, before computers and so forth, so you photocopied stuff and popped it away for posterity. Uh, looks like there I've been thinking about, looks there like I've been making some notes about what I might include, not include, etc. in the combined game. Uh, and I think at one stage I had this idea of um, playing out the, the battles more tactically. Um, so I, I got this, or the idea of... I think the ships fit the hex. Yeah. I had the idea of, you know, ships moving around, firing at each other. Um, while people detract the game as Yahtzee at sea, buckets of dice rolling, which is you know, basically correct, uh, certainly it's not within a bull's roar on a simulation level, uh, but I feel that at the strategic level, they're actually not bad simulations. Oh, here was a, a variant by Avalon Hill, Eastern Fleet Order of Appearance chart, which you might not be able to read, um, again by Richard Hamblin. He deliberately left out a lot of the later British uh, fleet arriving, because uh, he felt it imbalanced the game too much and in terms of actually uh, historically helping to conquer Japan was more hit and run raids. Um, argue that amongst yourselves as you will. But he came up with a variant that included quite powerful British units towards the end of the game. Um, he said basically uh, to balance things up, take a point of control from the an area called the Bay of Bengal and put it back in Indonesia. So the Indon uh, Japanese got more points for controlling that. Uh, let's just put that away. Um, of all the variants, people tend to be reluctant to fiddle with the... You know, let's take this out here. Oh, Cecil B. DeMille, I ain't. People seem to be reluctant to fiddle with the victory in the Pacific map. Um, now, again, as I say, 1970, so you're talking fairly garish uh, map designs by today's standards. Um, I disagree. I don't think there's enough sea areas in this game. It's too easy to get from Japan to Hawaii and vice versa. And the killer is truck. From truck, on turn two, the Japanese can place raiding ships in the Hawaiian islands. Um, now, to fix that, in an ideal world, I would create my own wonderful map with more sea areas. I would have, I think Midway should be here where Pearl Harbour is. That should be something like Iwo Jima. Um, I think the Solomon Islands should have their own sea area. Um, Indonesia should be split into South China Sea and Java Sea, etc., etc., etc. It should be a lot harder for the Japanese to spread out. Now, it might mean adding one or two turns extra to the game. 
Um, but I just think it's it's it fails. So many games you see the Japanese taking and occupying Pearl Harbor. Now, if they do that, the American fleet simply moves to Samoa. Ridiculous. The Japanese never, never were in a position to take Pearl Harbor. They simply didn't have the, um, well, first off, the will. The army wouldn't release the required troops. Um, the idea of Midway was not to use it as a base of operations to potentially invade Pearl Harbor. The whole point of Midway, as I understand it, was to destroy the American carriers um, because the Japanese were upset that poor old Emperor Hirohito had to go running for a, a shelter because of those... Um, is it B-25, Mitchells? Forgive me if I've got that wrong. Uh, Doolittle's raid on Japan uh, put the wind up them um, as per that um, recent movie. So anyway, I would change that. I would change this map as well as the War at Sea map. Failing that, um, our club is going to play a combined game. And what we're going to try is that the Japanese can't place patrolling ships, remember only patrolling ships um, and land-based air can control a uh, sea area. Uh, we're going to say that the Japanese can't place either of those into um, the Hawaiian Islands until they first control both Midway and Johnson Island. Likewise, um, to stop the Americans simply massing at Midway and invading Japan on turn five of what is a eight or nine turn game, the Americans must first, there was a reason they did all that island, island hopping, the, Jap the Americans before they can place patrolling ships or land-based air in um, the Japanese islands, they must first control uh, Saipan and Okinawa. Um, trying to put a bit more... As, as with most of the variants, trying to put just a little bit more historicity into the game. All right, we'll pack that up and we'll finish off by having a look at uh, victory at sea. Okay, so last but by no means least, uh, victory at sea released by Jedco Games, I think 1992, somewhere around there. Uh, there was a Japanese version of this released, and I think on Board Game Geek, uh, I've seen rumour that Compass Games are trying to release this particular, or re-release, I should say, this particular game. Uh, again, I may have the company names not quite right or whatever, but yeah, there, there's something afoot about re-releasing this. So this was... John Edwards upgrading the original design of uh, the War at Sea. So let's just open up and, and have a look. The actual ship values and the number of counters per se didn't change. He did add a couple of things such as admirals uh, and uh, fiddled with the U-boat uh, warfare Um you can see here, these these are actually, I think, the original War at Sea counters, I think, from the Avalon Hill version. Um, I think I've got something tucked, tucked in under here. Um, oh, yeah, the old, the old tray. Let's get that out just for a sec. Um, I did have the LG2 design re-release of... Victory at Sea or War at Sea 2. I'll just pop that down for a sec. There we go. Uh, I didn't keep it. Uh, for whatever reason, I think I just... You know how uh, car companies, they can be really good, but just every now and again, for no particular reason, you'll just get one that's a lemon. Um, well, my copy of LG2 was, unfortunately, it was a lemon. The board had completely bowed and bent, and no matter what I tried, couldn't uh, fix. The counters uh, hadn't been uh, punched out, you know, ready to be punched out. The machine, something had gone wrong, and so you were literally stabbing at the counters trying to cut them out. 
Um, from memory, I think I, I pretty much just wound up throwing most of it out, uh, unfortunately, sadly. Uh, but I did manage to salvage some of the more important counters. Um, mines. Uh, some of the... Uh, guns. Uh, what else are oh, the... Let's have a look. Some of the aircraft counters. Sorry about the glare. Uh, and admirals. There's a German. There's a British one in there as well. Anyway, you get the idea. So fortunately, I managed to save those, and they've come in quite, quite handy. There was nothing wrong with the LG2 version. It was, you know, as in terms of rules, etc. Unfortunately, I think I just got a dodgy copy. Whoop. Unfortunately, I think I just got a dodgy copy. Uh, let's have a look at the map board. Now, this is, I think, a much better map board than the War, the original War at Sea map, both in quality and uh, design. Uh, let's try and get an overhead view. Oh, that glare. Sorry about that. It's a bit of a funny day here down in the south of Australia, I'm down in Victoria today. It's one minute it's sunny, next minute it's cloudy and overcast. So forgive that glare. Um, added the Caribbean Sea, an actual thing there for the oilers. Changed the rules for American entry. The original War at Sea had these funny rules where um, Americans entering the war, or sorry, the USA entering the war, not Americans, um, had to roll and it became increasingly more likely that they would be able to join in operations the further the game went rather than simply, oh yeah, we're here. Uh, yeah, um, now in, in the original War at Sea, uh, there was no, remember I talked about patrolling ships and raiding ships, uh, that didn't exist. Simply the British put to, put to sea, as I say, the Germans had put to sea, the Italians had put to sea and they'd fight it out. And the trouble was that the, uh, the Germans could mass in a particular area and they often had combat bonuses and they blew whatever the British had in a particular area out of the water so often by the end of the game that uh, I tended to find the British were trying to fight on the smell of an oily rag. This had a couple of good ideas, uh, a British home fleet. You could put three ships there with a speed of six or greater uh, and after the Germans and well, Italians had moved, they were like a reaction force, a bit like raiders in Victory in the Pacific. They could, they could only go one sea area um, but you could you could almost reenact, say Bismarck and Prince Eugen go fluffing into the North Atlantic. You have Hood, Prince of Wales, and um, uh, Norfolk or Suffolk there. Dunk, out they come. Um, yeah, all, almost a bit of a, a recreation of that. Uh, important things included. Uh, guns there at Gibraltar, so no more free sailing for the Italian cruisers backwards and forwards between there. They got shot at, etc., etc. Likewise, the English Channel mines, um, no more free wheeling and dealing between Germany and the South Atlantic without or getting to Brest there without being shot at. Um, in a sense, a shame that this wasn't the game first released. Um, with the U-boats, there's a system there for sort of at a rudimentary level simulating the ebb and flow of how effective the U-boats were. Um, overall, a, a, in my opinion, a much better game than the original War at Sea. Uh, you can see, though, even here, I can't help myself. I've Put it with a little letter set, I've put a three for axis control of the Mediterranean. Um, perhaps still not as comprehensive as War at Sea 2, um, 
but I would actually prefer this to war at C2, um, but increasing the number of um, ships and so forth. All right, let's wrap it up. So there you have it, viewer, an overview of a popular enduring game system. Uh, board games aren't anywhere near as popular, perhaps as once they once were. Uh, but still, I think there's still a good sizable community out there. And um, if you're looking for something that's not going to take too long to play, a bit on the lighter side, and you enjoy naval games, I would encourage you to give one of these a try. Uh, as I say, there always seems to be some new variant, some new design, some republishing um, on the horizon every, you know, every so few many years. Uh, failing all else, um, if you have got these games and you're looking perhaps to make them a bit better, well, as I say, don't forget, you could um, get yourself some replacement counters from Camelot Games. Um, I would encourage you to, um, if you are an aficionado, see if you can't get a copy of Admiral's War, or at the very least download this um, from the Canvas Temple Publishing website, I think I got it from, perfectly free. Um, don't want to sound like an ad, but um, uh, as I say, uh, this just reading through this uh, would give you an idea of whether you like it or not. And as I say, if you if you're up to printing your own maps, counters, all that sort of stuff, um, something like this uh, usually readily available on uh, eBay. Don't know that I'll be able to put any sort of um, game on. I'm not particularly good at that sort of thing where I video the game. I leave that sort of thing to the experts like you, Ralph, uh, Ralph Astley, if you're watching it all. Um, so, uh, in the not too distant future, hopefully some ancients coming up. Hope you're all well. Take care, everybody. Bye.